the training session and um, an overview of not only the Strava Metro product but also just Strava and um, pretty much everything we're offering to this date and then what we're hoping to offer in the, the coming future. So um, the idea being, as, as Joe just mentioned, that we'll kind of do three hours, we'll take a break after each one just to let everyone kind of do a quick five minute regroup. And the first part will be more or less about what's what's happening with um, with the Strava Metro product and what's Strava about. Then we'll go into the simple level and the details of the data, and then we'll move into more of our use cases. So really, so Strava Metro. First off, thank you, Florida, DRT, the, by far the largest contract um, that we've uh, that we've landed so far. <laughs> um, <laughs> It's also it's, it's it's the reason I'm down here. Um, you know, it's 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 exciting that you guys are so vested in it, and I want to make sure that you guys have the most success so that any, anybody else in the group would pretty much get off with the best foot when we're not running. All right, so let's see how this is going to work. So, kind of want to really put in the feeling of what we believe in with Strava Metro and why we're doing this and what it's all about, right? And this is this is what Strava is right now, right? So you go gliding down a bike path on a Saturday morning, you whip around, somebody pedal in the opposite direction, you give each other a nod, and all of a sudden you're a community, right? You're you're part of a group. And you look at each other and you go, hey, we're the same, we're doing the same thing. Let, we, let's be friends for a second, right? And so when people are using Strava and, and participating in the Strava Metro product, what they're doing is they're actually helping everybody they pass as they're riding along because the community of data is growing, it's multiplying, the community is getting bigger. And therefore, every time you ride someone and you know you're on Strava, you know you're pos and and your community is using Strava Metro, you're helping them. You're helping them have a safer ride the next time because hopefully the planning group is utilizing the data to help make their trip better. And to help reinforce this, I'm going to go and do a test and someone told me never to do this live, so I'm totally going to do it. Um, so this is something that we call flyby, and flyby, come on, load it, load it. Flyby is all about social people engagement, right? And this is what Strava's community and world and why Metro works is so important. So what we're doing here is we're loading in every single ride of a, and run of, an, of a community of, of, of users on Strava that I passed when I rode in, when I did a run in London on last Tuesday. And what you're going to see is when we select them all and we hit play, this, these are all the Strava users constantly moving in and out and around this little run that I did thinking that I would pass nobody. And this just shows the magnitude of people that are constantly moving in and out of a community like Strava and the fact that we're just doubling and doubling and doubling constantly. Um, and I'm the really slow guy at bread right here. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, I was shocked. I mean, this is, this is 9 a.m. These are all commuters. There's not one, this isn't recreation. Half of these guys are run commutes, half of them are ride commutes. But what it really told me when I got back is, I am part of something much, much bigger here than I realized. You know, I'm just a small fly into all these people's lives, and we cross paths, every single one of them, on this run. So, pretty exciting stuff to be to be part of, and um, I hope it really shows you guys like the power of where this data can go, what a social community with big social big data can, can bring. Return to full screen. Great. So that was that. So that's exciting. Um, hour one. Who and what is Strava? Why build Strava Metro? Right? We could have just left everything in an S3 warehouse buried deep inside a missile silo somewhere in, Austria, in Arizona um, and just turn our back to it all. Um, how do we define big data? You know, everyone talks about big data. Everyone talks about crowdsourcing. What, what do these really mean to Strava and how do, they, how do we get these back to you guys? And then we're going to go into like the key products in the Metro offering. Like What am I able to provide back? What are we able to do um, currently? And what do you guys ha now have? So to the who and what is Strava. Okay, this this is the Metro product, just, just, you know, with core routes. So, what is Strava? Strava is a website um, for cyclists and runners. It started off um, as a very much Garmin-centric, um, really competitive athlete back in 2008, 2009. In 2011, we started to release our apps, um, and since then, we've gone through I think gosh, 150 50 iterations of of our app cycles and going from the point where they were split and now they're back together. Because of that, we've turned ourselves into this 
really dynamic mobile community where most of our data is now on the mobile devices. We're growing rapidly outside the US. We now have the app translated in 15 languages. And it's 100% free, right? We don't flash ads to people. We don't, um, we don't require you to buy an app to, to use it. Um, or we make our revenue through 75% of our revenue comes through premium features, so we do have training um, features and things like that if you want to be involved in those. Um, then we have commerce making up the other part, and Metro slowly beginning to ramp up as it's becoming a global success. We're a San Francisco-based um, uh, company and with two satellite offices, one in Hanover, New Hampshire, uh, which is kind of where it was founded, and then one in London as well. We, and we just reached, I believe, 110 employees, actually. Um, if you haven't been on Strava, it's, uh, it's pretty cool. Um, you, it's very social feed. It's very similar to kind of like a Facebook feed for um, people who like to ride, run, get outside. Uh, so here's kind of like what that looks like here. We have a feed and you have your rides. And then on the left over here, you have your um, what the app looks like with your feed the same and then with, with our new display screen, which shows you where you are um, uh, as you're doing your road or your ride or your run. So that's great. but why did we decide to build Metro? And what happened was back in 2012, we started to receive a lot of requests from groups like yourselves, um, looking for data, trying to figure out ways to make informed decisions about cycling and pedestrian infrastructure and find out what's happening because you made those decisions and where are we lacking decisions. So we decided to go to the Rudy Center of Transportation and we decided to go talk to groups like yourselves and just kind of really get a collective grasp under what's happening or what isn't happening and what's missing. And you know, you can imagine we created this list of you know 200 more long of things that Strava could definitely help with and things that Strava could not help with. Um, the, clear, the clear, resounding voice that came out of it was, we don't have good cycling data, we don't have good pedestrian data, and we sure as heck don't have them on a consistent basis. Right? So that's number one. So we, we knew we had, had there was reason to get data out there. Number two is it continues to serve the Strava user, and that's really important to the, to the message of Strava, right? continue to serve our user base, continue just to make our, the, our users' lives better um, at every, every chance we can. So uh, you know, by, by providing data back, we know we can make things safer. The next step, though, is bonding the cycling and pedestrian community, right? Can we use this data to help make their world better on a day-to-day -day basis um, as a collective group? That then the, the initial quote, right? Can we all, we all be friends? Can we all get along? Can, can the fixie ride with the cruiser, ride with this, the uh, recreation rider? Can we all be part of this big community? Um, and I think we can, as that image showed. Also, we realized um, from personal experience in Vermont, um, where, the, where the DOT decided to put this really gigantic rumble strip up the side of one of the most iconic um, roads um, that pushed all the cyclists in the middle of the road, and they just said, well, we didn't have any data to, um, to, help, to help drive our decision. Um, that just shouldn't happen anymore. There's now a global data set that shows you where every single on every single road in the world where people ride or don't ride at this point. So we want to make sure that that never happened again. Um, and then there's been this worldwide outreach for data, right? There's been having over 2,500 requests globally at this point from Moscow to Johannesburg to London to um, um, Canmore, Canada. Right? I mean, they're small to big to to groups that to, to like Portland where you expect them to be all about data to Louisiana, which is just an up and coming trying to figure out how to make bike and pet planning. Um, in their area. And then the final thing is it's the right thing to do, right? There's big data out there. Why not use it the right way? Why, why try to play with people's emotions and things like that with big data and when you can actually do things really important and to a social good with big data? And that's what we decided to do. We to make this our bit of our, our mantra, our philosophy, the way we're going to move forward and Metro is the way we can do that. Which leads us right into, well, if you're going to use this, how are you going to protect all the users' privacy? Well, right now, we, did, we put this really in the, right in the front with our development. We decided to err way on the side of privacy to start with. and figure Because once you release all the private information, you can't pull it back. So if you start really, really private and really focus on protecting people and moving the other direction, then you can, really do, then you can actually really make a good, good choices and decisions and really weigh what you're going to open up later. Right? So right now, there's no way to bring Metro back to Strava. You can't look on there and find any ride or single ride or single individual and say that person is athlete number 732641, right? So that's important. First off, then, we switched, this, we switched the whole focus from streets, I mean, from individuals to streets, right? Most of the apps you've heard about, Cycle Tracks Atlanta, um, Cycle Philly, Cycle Toronto, all that, they, they focused on the, 
one person or a collective group of people and their and their individual trips and what that person did and how old they were and what the exact route. And we can't do that with Metro with Strava because we would then be showing everyone's house and you know then in areas like San Francisco we'd be showing 50,000 houses, right? And just it's not it doesn't work out. So we decided to switch it and say, well, let's just focus on the population of the streets. What's happening on these streets instead of what's happening in of a person, right? Because we don't talk about like the you know the one person in a Jetta and their exact route they took. You know, we might do an origin destination survey, but we don't really care their exact street paths. We just care about volume and flow on streets and how they get there. So let's focus on volume and flow of cyclists. Start taking creating data that can take on the automotive industry. But we also had to create an opt out, right? So we had we have an opt out switch on Strava that people can to switch out of the heat map, they can switch out of flyby, they can switch out of uh, Metro. It's a pretty much a global switch that says, I just don't want my data out there if there's anything on my feed. So far, we've had less than 0.001% people um, flip that switch, which is great, which means that we're doing this right. We're, we're, we're taking privacy um, seriously, and people recognize that, and they can see that their privacy concerns are being met. So what's our mission then, right? It's really simple. We make state-of-the-art spatial data products and services to make cycling, running, and walking in cities better. Really simple, right? We have the data to do it. We have the technology to do it. And now we're just pretty much getting the word out there at this point. So, like, so I'm sure most people have seen the heat map. Um, so why can't we just use this heat map, right? Just it's out there. It's free, and it's, it's colorful, it's, and it looks nice. Well. Yes, it does, because it's a viral pop sensation, right? It's supposed to look nice. It's supposed to get you talking. It's also supposed to trick you. It's also supposed to be a little bit sneaky, um, because that's what viral things do, right? They don't give you data. Um, there's no temporal scale on it. It's all times GPS points. Um, it's point saturation, not use saturation. It means uphills are always going to look hotter than downhills. Trails are always going to look hotter than everything else, because people go slower on those areas than other areas. But it is. Um, we also do large crops of the ends and st the ends and st um, starting ends and ends of rides, because again you got to protect privacy, right? So you got to be able to crop those ends out so you don't show where everyone's going to work or everyone's starting work. And that's also mixed rider types, right? So it's, you can't give them com commutes are the same as recreation. You can't start breaking anything down. You don't know time of day, anything like that. What is it? But so all that said, it does have some good uses, right? It shows that people ride bikes. You can take this to anywhere. You can put this on the on front of a city council and you can say, look, people ride bikes. And you can't deny that because, look, there's blue and white and there's use and you, they're there all over the place, right? And that's great and that's really important. Um, and it's also really great for keeping track of where you rode this year. I mean, it's actually kind of fun to kind of like create your own heat map of where you've been over year to year. Um, it's, 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 a, it's a rewarding experience as you start to fill in this thing um, over time. But I've seen a lot of groups doing pure planning using the metro heat map at this point, you know, and it being in like bike pet plants. And it's good for like that good snappy screenshot, but really it's like it doesn't tell you where people are actually riding. And I think it's pretty, once you ask it that question, it becomes pretty obvious. So what about uh, data restrictions and use? I think it's important just to get this out of the way. Um, we never sell it to private groups. Right, because we want to have price control on it. We believe that this, that this product should be in the hands of anybody and everybody um, in the world, and we have priced it accordingly so it can be accessible for any type of um, in town or city. Um, but we do try to sell it to the highest governmental entity that we can find so it can be trickled down, and that's what we did in Florida. Right? And so this is why Florida DT has it, and now they have the ability to move this data down to every city, town, planner, researcher, whatever they want that's going to, that, that is in that invested in helping them do research and or planning. Um, not many other data licenses that allow that to happen. Um, data can also be moved to the con to contracting groups like the engineering firms as projects come up. Um, what it can't be is it just can't be randomly thrown up to a public FTP site for public download. Really the only main reason behind this is it does show Strava's use and saturation in every single market that we provide, right? And we're giving you the exact number of users and area and a bit different. So, you know, in a, on a competitive basis, a corporate, you know, corporate, corporate, some of our competitors, that's something that we just would prefer not to be readily out there. However, aggregated results are fine for public download and display. We can create a normalized view of the zero to one of the value, so you can show more use to less use, things like that, that give you the ability. Um, and I've been reading this book by the founder of uh, um, Patagonia, right? And he's got this huge um, philosophy with the environment and 
and their whole and almost one of the biggest reasons Patagonia is even around is because it's trying to save the environment. And one of the things he says, you know, to do good, you actually have to do something. And I think this is where Strava really came to, that we wanted to do something good, but you can't just say, I'm going to do something good. You actually have to create something that's going to help do good. And so this is kind of like Strava Metro is our is our way to to make create something that's going to work like to create good. I don't have a clock or anything here, so probably going way too fast because that's what I usually do. <laughs> um, all right, so big data, right? Um, what you see here, this is uh, this is um, Seattle. We've done sub projects for groups all around the world now, from Brisbane to uh, London to um, Seattle, where we're trying to break the data down for them to help them get a deep understanding of it before they move. So what this is, this is the intersection level data product, right, with the nodes and that with the underlying street network with use on it. And the nodes are symbolized through four categories in this case, just, you know, we typically just break them into whatever makes the most normal chunks for, you know, zero to five second at weight at an intersection or five to 10 or 15, 20 or, you know, 20 or greater. And with the idea being is you can start to overlay all the intersection data with your corridor data and start to see, okay, well, here's my, co my top trends, or my top corridors, and where are my key intersections on these top corridors? So if I'm really interested in flu through, through, through flow, I can then isolate the, the potential bottlenecks that are slowing down my morning, my morning time commute. So let's drop it by the numbers, and heat maps, right? Um, right now we're, we're collecting over 5 million activities a week and rapidly growing. I think when I gave this presentation, uh, six weeks, six months ago, we were at three million up activities a week. So it's just this, you know, this social world is all about, in, you know, rapid gains in users. Um, we have millions of active users. Uh, we don't really disclose exact numbers, as you can probably imagine, but we do have over 450 billion GPS points globally. Um, and, that, and you know, if you imagine it's five million activities, about four million, about about 4,000 um, GPS points per activity, you guys can do the math, right? Probably more important is this idea that we're Global. We have global coverage. Um, so any data that you guys, any processes or code that you guys develop, could be immediately usable by somebody in Tokyo, because the data is seamless. It's the same format. It's the same data. It's all about lines. It's all about use on networks. So um, you know, data uh, processes created in Orlando can be used by Tampa. Tampa can be Tallahassee, and so on and so forth. So you guys can be sharing and creating this community of how to use data within your own network, and it's all just seamlessly handed off. Um, this is pretty exciting, and it's you know another big thing to, 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 that I want to like point out here is in the middle, when you look at the zoomed out U.S., you would think that nobody rides in here, but yet when you zoom in on them, you know sometimes they they pop up, and it's because we normalize the scale. You get these gravitational dark holes, which we'll talk about a little bit later, but cities are always going to pull and light up so much more than uh, the rural areas because well that's where your population centers are. That doesn't mean nobody's riding in the rural areas. It just means in relationship to Orlando. The adjacent cities, probably their towns don't have as many users because they don't have as many people. It doesn't mean they don't have as much of a population saturation using Strava as them. It's just important to think about when you have this global data set that you need to zoom in and out when you over the areas that you're looking to really do the analysis on. So some technical details for, um, for groups that for people that are interested, because a lot of people actually really are interested in, in what Strava uses and what they do and um, how we kind of scale. So we're pretty much all Amazon cloud-based. Uh, we keep all of our data up in S3. Most of the rides are stored in actually a flat file system, which is interesting, but um, it allows us not to have to spatially enable, uh, spatially index every single ride to do uh, analysis on it. It's actually a pretty straight up math process that uses microclusters. So when things ramp up, we can microcluster spread out, fire up about 10,000 new computers up in the cloud, process the demand, and then bring them back down. And it takes about one second. Um, we are Ruby on Rails backend, um, and the actual website runs on more of a MySQL type of a um, component. But the Geo team, which is located in Hanover, runs pretty much a Postgres, PostGIS on backend with on a bunch of SSD um, uh, MacBook Pros, uh, actually Mac Pros, not notebook, which is pretty exciting with R two D two things. <clears throat> um, and with with most of that code wrapped around that, it is Python and Ruby as well. For our analytics, we use something called Redshift and Looker. Redshift is a really cool Amazon um, database view that actually uses Postgres as well, but it's it, it like denormalizes everything and lets you. And it's really powerful with joins, and then we use this Looker dashboard to try to create analytics inside of that. It's kind of, kind of some interesting, cool technology. 
so some, this is kind of a little good, a little good feel good. Um, by the numbers, what's who's using Strava data? Like this is like how how does this community push its way out, right? So right now we're about fifty five hundred thousand. Let's just say five hundred thousand for fun. Uh, five hundred thousand at Strava athletes users, whatever we want to call them. Um, are currently their data is currently being utilized to some given of the um, group within the world, um, and if you take all those populations of all those groups around the world, we are impacting approximately 90 million people, or around one percent. So it's pretty great penetration for something that pretty much started in grassroots, um, has a team of one and a half. Um, it's pretty cool. Hey Brian, uh, Joe here. I, I have. Um got one or two questions from folks on the line. I was just wondering if I could just take a moment and ask. Ask. Yeah, uh, that's great. Right for any kind of questions. So let me get my chat open here. Yeah, one of the questions was uh, whether or not we had a heat map for Florida. Um, I we we did not create a custom heat map for Florida. Um, Something we could easily do. Um, okay. When we, we do create custom heat maps because there are groups that want this custom. They really value the heat map. Well, like I said, the heat map doesn't ask, doesn't answer questions for you, right? You can ask the heat map how many cyclists. You know, we're on this slightly blue line compared to that blue line. It doesn't really work, right? Um, but right. what it, um, but we can build them up. And we give you two extra zoom layers, so instead of 15, you're at 17. And you have the, you have a bunch of toggles on and off, so you can actually toggle on commute rides only. You can toggle right. on AM rides, PM rides, weekends. So it's something we could talk about. Okay, all right. Uh, we did get a comment that it's awesome how you can track the movement earlier on. You showed that that was pretty awesome. And uh, also as an administrative point, just to kind of keep everybody in the loop here. Right now we're showing around 220 people on on the on participating via the web. So thank you for all for participating. Uh, if for whatever reason the audio, if you're having some audio issues, if you could let me know, do it. Just send me a chat. And uh, also, if you have any questions, feel free to use that question pod within the web uh, the webinar. So oh, also, I wanted to let everybody know too that uh, Sean Davis uh, has uploaded some handouts. Uh, in the handout section, we have a Florida training outline document, and we also have a handout for the Strava Metro. Uh, feel free to download those. That's all I had. Thank, thank you, Brian. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, that, this is great. It's such a great audience. It, it, you know, it's, such, it's really exciting for me. It's definitely one of the larger groups I've ever spoken to, with half, being half here and there and in the, in, in, in the cloud. So it's pretty exciting. Well, we had, we had 300 people registered, so we may get a few more. Uh, folks at logging in here shortly. If, if everyone stays off for three hours, I think I owe everyone a beer. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. Um, so I'll, but yeah, I'll of course, let you talk a little room, bit. Go ahead. If Go ahead. anyone in this, this room or anywhere anywhere else, yeah, please just jump in with questions. I, um, for the record, I, I'm a database guy. Um, I'm more of a data guy, and like I said, we had a team of two building this, and all of a sudden, someone had to talk about it, and. I'd speak better than my coworker. He's better with the computer, so it had to be me. Um, so I've kind of turned into this role of, of talking about Metro and moving forward. Um, and as it will go on towards later. You'll, you'll see that we are making advance, We are making investments into Metro now that we've um, proven that it, what it can do. Um, but we'll get there. So any question? Technical details. Metro product. Right. So this is you know here you can see this is Florida. Um, and this is from the 2012 data set, actually, I think, and it's this, just a really simple view of the most of joining in the, the street ID back to the to the street data and viewing the entire use of the every single street that was available in the NavTech slash year database based upon total cycle total cycle trips. Right. I took a pretty um I, I went with just a geometric uh, symbolization on this one because I really wanted to get the colors and pop in there. I mean, you can obviously do Jenkins and all these different type of really cool colors that will actually let you know individual routes pop and not. But this is this gives it a nice view of just like ah, oh, that's you know, that's use. That's like that's people just on our roads constantly across the, their entire state. So what's our history? Um, 
we began R and D in 12, and I've hit on some of these, but we, we did R and D in 2012-2013. Uh, we started the beta partnership with uh, Metro Orlando and Oregon DOT right around 2013. Um, the first products, which was street only, um, shipped in January of 2014, and then I learned a whole lot about um, social media on May 1st, and we had a fast launch on May 5th. Um, don't respond to public comment boards. It's not a good idea. Um, so we uh, we have or we then we immediately recognized that we were lacking a big piece of the data. Like why we wanted to protect everyone's privacy, we also were protecting it so much that we were fundamentally losing track that there's all the or the concept of zonal movement, origin destination is really important in the, in the transportation industry. Um, and so much of this was learning. Like uh, to be honest, I'm I'm a forest management major from Oregon State, right? I mean, this this is not trees anymore. Um, and you know, in my it's been a really incredibly exciting 15 month um, learning experience for me and I feel like I had a much deeper understanding than I did back then but we realized we were missing out that piece. We, we couldn't, we, if we didn't show where, where these people were starting and ending in zones then you could never figure out if you had a region that was really strong or not strong with, with cycling. So we created the OD, OD product really quickly after we released it, so about July 2014. And then we decided to add in this new idea of nodes and intersections in November of 2014. And since then, we've kind of just been in this, where are we, what are we, what, what's, you know, what's the interest, and we're um, trying to roadmap where the next year is going to go. And I'll share some of that towards the end here. All right, so that's kind of the background of, like, who and what and, you know, the history of Strava. So let's going to start talking a bit about the actual data. And I'm going to try not to get too in the weeds with some of this stuff, but at the same time, that is kind of what this is about, like, you know, talking about, like, format and structure, digitization direction, you know, how we actually do the matching um, pitfalls, you know, QC, like, what doesn't it do very well? Like, it's just as important as what, is it do what it does do well because you don't want to create, you don't want to create the wrong um, inf uh, conclusions out of something because um, you felt that was the right thing to do and it was actually not built that way. So, hey, street-level data. Gonna, well, yeah. Brian, I was going to ask a favor. Yeah, I got quite a few questions uh, from the online folks. I was wondering, before we get too much in the data just yet, that um, if you don't mind me asking a few questions. Sure, go for it. Okay. Um, uh, one question was, how do you identify, and feel free, if you, if you plan to cover these qu questions in, the, in your presentation, then we'll just, we'll just hold on. But, one uh, one question uh, was how do you identify multimodal trails? Well, um, at this point, we I would say the best way to identify a multimodal trail would actually be to blend the the uh, the, site, the cycling and the pedestrian data together into the same into the same um, field. So by, by that, I would mean that um, I nobody's ever asked that question. Um, so. We provide the data in two separate pieces. We don't merge them into one, right? And so what you would do is you have the pedestrian data format, and then you have the cycling data format. And the formats are actually the same. It's just a reference, reference of this is about the pedestrian data, and this is the cycling data. And the reason we keep them separate is because you know the, this idea of like um, the um, act time and our act time, right? The reverse activity time and the and the forward activity time. If you mix in your pedestrian data, that's going to be all over the board, right? And if you have them all going at the same time on that same level, on that same path between two nodes, they're going to, it's going to skew all that, those, that, that time much lower. So we'd have to create a, a many more fields to be able to um, adjust or account for the cycling pedestrian. So it was easier for us to just provide you a full separate pedestrian level and, uh, and a bike level. So then what I would do, and this is great analysis, is you take the, the street data for both of them, you create two, two edge files, and you join in your uh, pedestrian data, and you join in your um, your um, your cycling data. Get rid of all the other fields, just go with total use, and then merge them all where total use on both of them is greater than X, right? So now you have a field where you can actually say, because I, I wouldn't go with something that where there was one or two cyclists, right? Because sometimes there's going to be people that just ride on things they shouldn't do, but what I would do is focus on the groups, those multimodal trails where you have a cycle count greater than X in per percentage of population to the pedestrian count of Y, and therefore then you can start to find these multi multimodal trails that will be utilized for both user bases. Excellent. All and, right, if you and, want, if... and if you want towards the end, we can, I'll actually pull up and do it, because it's actually kind of cool. So. Okay. And then uh, one other one is uh, in regards to uh, 
Could we please get some clarification on what licensed users mean? Licensed users is going to be anyone that Joe, you, or in the DOT says is allowed to use the data. Okay. Looking up All right. at Joe's. <laughs> that's all good and I think that's still since this is still kind of new in our court um, I know I'm working with others within the agency uh, Christopher Francis for example is going to be my uh, the department's lead point of contact when working with this data so uh, I think we haven't really clearly defined that just yet but at least on paper so I think that would be forthcoming from this uh, that we would work on coming up with who the licensed users would be. Right. I mean, from our perspective, we would just like to be able to have access to reach out to those individuals at some point just to make sure that they're succeeding with the data. Um, right. For us, that, that's the important piece. And as we, as we move on, we are creating some, some tools online that would be valuable to other groups um, as they work through the data that would be, we would love to make sure that they do are available to them as well. Okay. Very good. And uh, I actually do have one one person that I was going to open up the audio to, uh, he's been patient. Um, Governor um anyways, uh, Governor I'm going to take your, you have your hand up, I'm going to take your audio off and uh, you'll be able to speak or at least ask a question if you have a question. Okay, so I guess uh, with that then um, we'll just go ahead. Thank you, Brian. Okay, sure. Okay, yep. All right, so the street level data, right? This is, this and everything that we provide with the data is minute to the minute. This means that it's unique to the minute to the minute. We had to come up, we had to pick a temporal scale and a spatial scale. We let you guys determine the spatial scale, but temporal is always going to be by the minute, right? So we can report everything by the minute. So it's important to know whether it's the o nodes or the OD or the streets, all the raw data all represents use by a given minute. Okay? So you're talking between every single intersection and piece of road, right in front, intersection, light to light, we're reporting the data on that intersection for the whole year by the minute. So of course that means there's gonna be a many to one relationship, right? You're gonna have you're gonna have there's many minutes per day. And so therefore you can have as many minutes per year as associated with a given edge. So we, got, we calculated that for Oregon when we first ran it and it was going to be, if every single edge was written by every single minute, it was going to be something like 7.7 .7 trillion records. Thankfully it wasn't. Um, but it can get really big really fast to the point. Right? We also show preferred direction and we do this with digitization direction. Which way was the line drawn in to the program? Um, that where we can show use going one way versus the other way. And you can see that in here with, with the um, AF ath count and then our ath count, right? Ath count, our ath count. So that's ath, um, the number of users going one direction and the number of users going the other direction. Number of activities going one way, the number of activities going the other way, from to reverse, right? Um, so you got the you have the, ath, the athletes, and so it's, it's a Strava thing. It's pretty much we look at it as if you're on a bike, you're more athletic than someone on a bus at that time. So um, I just it's just an easier way to go, right? So, so you're all athletes if you're on Strava at this point. Um, and then you have your total and your time. And if no, there was no time, we left it at negative one, so it wouldn't impact some of the roll-ups. So we can ignore negative one. And you can see, you know, this one was um, at count 14, 14, eight the other way, one, uh, 104 one way, 125. So this is that rolled-up view, right? So you can see, like, just one, a one-to-one -one relationship. One, one edge number one has this number of users. Number two has this number of users for 2014 ride roll-up total which you guys just picked out today. And then you also have the ability with this commute flag, this CM, CMT, CNT, of the commute versus recreation. So unless you start to isolate out the recreation trips from the commute trip, I mean from the, um, from the commute trip. So recreation, commute, can we, can, we, can we separate them, can we isolate them? Sean? One note about when you're talking about this size mm -hmm. direction, with the data set that we're using, NASCAP, it doesn't always follow the travel direction. So it's not always going to be consistent. It's not going to be what you expect. It is a lot of the times that you can't count on. So it's just a, a note about the way the line was drawn. Again, it's not always with the flow of traffic. 
Yeah, Sean was just saying that you can't always rely on the um, on the line interaction to be with traffic, and of course that also makes sense because sometimes one line represents a, a double direction road, and you know, with, so you have to be pretty on with 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 the understanding the digitization direction um, to to really start to use utilize that that field. So the next one, OD, right? So this is the polygonal starting and ending points again by the minute. All right, so you can see right here. So you have this OD, this polygon ID, starting ID. Um, year, day, hour, minute, and whether or not it was a commute, and then your destination polygon ID. Super. Um, then the intersections data. Um, wait, so is your wait time to intersections, congregate, congregation of users at intersections, minute by minute with the purpose flag, right? So this is the, again, it has the node ID, the year, the day, the hour, the minute, and the number of users going, um, number of athletes congregating one way and activities congregating the other way, as well as your, and again, this is this is median, right? So we're talking, um, it's important that we use median wait time instead of maximum wait time, because the median wait time is, gets rid of some of these um, outliers, right? These, these, um, these points that are, uh, how do you say it? Somebody goes to a, uh, is riding along and they see a friend on the, on the corner and they talk to their friend, and they're still waiting there, and the GPS is running, and now they've been there for 10 minutes, and then they leave, right? The wait time there really isn't 10 minutes. It just happens to be they had a conversation with their friend and left their shop off. So if you do mini, if you do maximum, maximum, you're always gonna jump ahead and, and grab that um, and get way too high of a value. And the same as you go minimum, some of those GPS might drift and shoot right through it, and then you're gonna get um, bad data that way. So we do median on, on this to, um, to see how, how that goes. Um, then you have the commute as well, and so when you do the roll-ups, it's the same thing. It's the median of the medians, the median of the maximum, the medians of the minimums, um, and the total commute time. Now, but one thing to recognize on this is, you could, so if you start thinking it through, if you're doing, if you have the, all these records, like see these, let's say these, you know, four all appear to be the same block, um, same intersection. So 26, 26, 26, 26, and they're all slightly different days, slightly different hours, minutes. Well, if you were to add all these up in these different times, you know, or do medians, you would start to see like you know, maybe some lower values with this one being one, but you have a couple here that are set to two. Well, really, what you want to start to do is start to create some type of a weighted average here. So you have this, these, these two riders being waiting, waiting for five seconds shouldn't be weighted, it shouldn't be on the same playing field as one person for, for three seconds, right? And the same vice versa for, for here with their maximum min. So just take into account the number of records you have there to create a weighted average at the same time as you create your, your median roll up. The next thing we provide um, to go along with those three set, those three data sets um, is the idea of this demographics and tourism data. Um, so what this is, is it's a reflection of um, of the sample, it's not a sample because it's the, it's the full poll of the users, but it's, it's the representation of all the Strava users that were part of this data that was used to create it. So this is the um, the Florida data, so for 2014, so you have 43,176 users, made up almost 800,000 rides, then you get your average distance and your median distance, and your average time and median time, um, and those are in meters and seconds, and then you get your male count population, and then a demographic breakdown of that male count population, and then a female count, and the female count population, and then a commute count as well. So as you find, um, and then on the other one, which I don't know if we've provided this to you guys yet, Joe, but this is something that I think would be really interesting, exciting for you guys. And this is one we built for, for Vermont. Um, and oops, wrong way. And this is the um, a tourism level data, right? And it's with Strava, it's a little bit different. We don't know the address of most of our users, right? Because we do something called onboarding, and onboarding is where you, as an app developer or, or company, try to get somebody to use your app as fast as possible, with as, pain, as painless as possible. And to do that, you go first name, last name, email, right? That's all you know about a person when you first get on. You get, you try to get more information on them later, but if you ask them like 15 questions, like give me your address, you know, and this and that, most people are just gonna go three to three or four and they go, ah, forget it, I don't care. Um, so we onboard, we onboard really well, um, to be honest. But in onboarding really well, we lose so much information about our users, which is why so many people like cycle tracks, you know, when they do their engagement, they talk about, you know, they're asking so many questions, they lose engagement really fast, right? We don't, because we don't ask those questions. We just say, use the data. Um, so what do we do? We create something called a Strava home location. 
right? This is actually all of the, everyone who's on Strava has their own home location defined by Strava, and this is actually a reflection of where you ride and or run down to a county level. Um, we can bring it to zip code if you wanted to and things like that, but really at the county level is something we can find globally, um, and zip codes don't persist globally. So in this case, this is Vermont, and they were rather shocked to find out that the majority of people that actually ride in Vermont are actually from Massachusetts. Um, and But then if you think about it, it makes sense. There's a huge cycling tourism industry in Vermont, um, mountain biking and road cycling. And they're actually like, yes, more proof, more tourism, more money to go into the, into the coffers for that kind of a type of promotion. Um, so we can provide this back for, for Florida as well to show you know, where the cyclists are coming from. Yes, Gabrielle? So I, you know, just for the folks here in the audience and then you know, just people listening, I think this is so crucial for us to, when we're talking about the regional corridors, coast to coast, um, selling bicycling infrastructure, uh, I mean, here in Central Florida, I do think that we have a good share, obviously being, you know, Disney World and stuff like that, not to say another word. But, um, you know, when we're, when our budgets roll around and, you know, we want to show how many people have used why cycling uh, ecotourism is such an important component, it, I think this would absolutely help us so much. So hopefully we do have this data available for the locals and for the state as well. Great. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I think it's 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 a, it's a critical data set to start to show that there are a lot of people coming down there as tourism on all sides of the uh, of the area. Yeah. How do you determine a commute versus a recreational ride? So the question was, how do we determine a commute versus a recreation ride? Um, I'm just going to explain it instead of pulling up one of the other slides from a different presentation. So there's right now there's three ways and there's a fourth way coming. Right, so there's always been this the um this commute flag within Strava within Strava.com, so where you can go to a ride, click it, click the button, and that'll hard flag it. And that's actually really important for us to find rides that are really hard to determine as a commute um, automatically. Right, so you start work here, and you go over here, and you find you have a coffee. I'm drawing on the board, so you guys can't see this, so but that's okay. Um, and then you stop here for stop at a different location for lunch. So now you've had a coffee, and now you've had lunch, picked up some did some mail and you ended up back at work, and it took like an hour and a half, right? You had three commute trips, it was a circle though, so you started at the same location, it took an hour and a half. Without us knowing that was called a commute, it's really hard for us to look at that, because starting in the same location typically means it's a training ride, for the most, for the most part. Um, so that, that native flag on the website really helps us locate those really challenging ones. Um, the second one is we actually scrape names, right? We find people love to name their rides funny things you know, to work or SF2G, which is San Francisco to Google or, um, you know, home or to Grammys or whatever. But we can scrape these like two words and that allow us to, to establish this is most likely a trip to a destination, to work, to home, to, to, to the bakery. Um, so then find another subset that way. And then we do what Strava is really good at and that is spatial geo matching. That's the whole idea of the segments that we run, right? These concepts of point to point, can we match how many people did this? So if we can say, well, let's see, what's the definition of a commute? Is it um, you know, point to point, a certain time frame and a certain duration um, during a certain day maybe, right? Um, so we can locate those that way. So if it's more than a kilometer apart, more than a mile apart from a certain ending location and um, at some time of the day, less, less than an hour. And then we, but we, we find that actually the Strava users will do, are, are a little bit more ambitious than what the MAP21 specs say or you know, the government, than what the census says where any ride less than three miles, most people only ride six miles or less. Like the Strava user is going to go 10 miles on a bike and, do, and no problem do a commute, right? So we have that kind of a, that we, so we find that pretty often. Um, but we also locate that starting in the same location, doing an 80 mile training ride, that's not a commute. Um, the third one which will come out in September is the ability for it to be on the app. So there will be now a commute app button that you can save, click, hit the button and flag it as a commute. Um, Sorry, so you, you bundle up utilitarian purposes with the music? Yes. It's been a it's, it's been like semi-religious debates um, in the office over this with with me taking a much more conservative commute approach like commute is work only and where my coworker is commute or is um, a commute is any trip between two destinations and not for pure for purely recreation so he would include a 80 mile trip bike ride to his beach house because he's got to get there I'm like eh. 
I don't know. You know. So, but what we do is we flag them all as commute and say, do you, you want to care about Saturday commutes for someone who's doing that a, a ride to a friend's house or a barbecue or something like that? It's there, and you can look at it that way. If you only want to look at commutes Monday through Friday from six to eight, from six to nine a.m., then just look at those. It's right there. You can extract that data in whatever format and whatever way you want. So we kind of just said, here, you know what? You guys know your local community better. You, we're, we're, you know, we're. We're talking globally. We can't make those kind of choices for everyone. So we're going to give you guys the power to then extract that data back out yourself for your projects as you see fit. And then the, ne the next step on all that will be smart locations, right? Oh, you've done it. You did. You flagged this as a commute five times. Well, we pretty much know where your home work are now. So now we're just going to automatically flag that for you. But that's a couple more steps down. One of the best parts that I like about this, this um, the way that we built Strava Metro is the idea of this macro and micro levels. Um, if you want to just look at Florida as a whole and just see these like kind of hot corridors here and here and there, here and there, you can do that. You know, there's your full routes. You can see some of your hot corridors, not taking into account any type, anything but just pure activity use. Well, if you want to, you then you can also just hone in on Orlando and say, well, just give me my only my morning commute routes. And then you can just quickly find routes that are designed more, that are being primarily used more for commute routes. And then take it one more step and say, I only care about four pieces of road section, and I want to see that by the minute. Well, you can just extract those four pieces of road, get all your minute, minute, minute data out of there, and start to view the minute to minute pulses along that given three sections, three pieces of road for the whole year. All right, so it's that macro way out for the year, down to that minute, three pieces of road geometry by the minute. Whatever you feel like looking at. That's, by having this data in this format, it allows you to just move back and forth seamlessly between all these different data layers. I actually do it awesome on time. This is great. Um, so that was kind of the um, where I got to on this on the um, for the first section for the first hour. Kind of leaves ten minutes for questions. Joe, do you have anything on that side? Uh, um, yeah, I do. Uh, first of all, I was going to ask people in the room if they had any questions. Okay, yeah, let me ask. Yeah. No worries. Yeah, I've got a few questions online though, uh, and just to let you know, we still have we have up to 225 attendees. So, excellent, excellent. Um, there, there was one question in here talking about like, um, kind of like that next step with kind of getting numbers for underserved communities. Um, I know. I, I don't know on a national standpoint, you know, is that something that you um, kind of are working through as far as data sources for folks that may not have the opportunity to have the app available and to use it? Right. So it's the idea, the idea of equity, right? Um, equity. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. So this is kind of the, the, here's, the, here's the Strava take on on equity at this point. Um, Again, this is something that I, I was not really aware of or was not really in my vocabulary in May of 2014. So this is something that I really come to ramp up and learn about the community and what this means to the cycling pedestrian community. So right now we know 65 to 70 percent of all U.S. citizens, um, adults, um, have um, access to smartphone GPS technology. And that's from the Supreme Court ruling, right? So that leaves a solid 30 percent of the population that doesn't have access to that. Um, there's also going to be a set of cyclists and pedestrian users that never want to be tracked, right? So they're the invisible cyclist. The person just doesn't really, they check out, not check in, right? Um, and I'm, I'm that person sometimes too. Um, we have worked with some local groups, um, with uh, Corpus Christi in Texas, as well as with um, a group in Wisconsin called Fox Valley, to try to see what we can do by just trying to really hit home with a local, local community. Like, can we drum, how much more use can we drum up? Um, it's been mixed success, right, um, with, with how much can a government entity try to do drum it up. Um, we do find something in, like, by Cascade was in Seattle that we're finding a larger increase in total use as they've been promoting us. And that's a pretty well-known big cycling um, organization. So we're finding that the bike advocacy organizations have the ability to get more of that, more equity use um, on Strava. Um, what we do find, though, is regardless of where of, of of where of where the um, the area is, if there is any good infrastructure there, if there's some place where someone is going to choose to ride, 
mill with that has like either a protected bike lane or some type of a good surface, the Java user community is going to gravitate towards that area. Um, and I also find that when you load, when you line the, the throw the Strava data on, and you see that black hole over there, you see that that that, that region of, of a of a network that doesn't seem to have the use that you expect it to have, then that's actually a really good catalyst to, to go in and say why. I mean, if you want use there and you have no cycling infrastructure there, then you pretty much need to have a pretty good understanding of why there's no use there, right? Um, Orange County has the data, and they were telling me all about like how great the data, how much data use there is up in these these hills over here, and you know, how they put all this great infrastructure in here. But really, the Strava Metro data lets them down, down in the, the city where they just haven't invested anything into cycling infrastructure. And I said, well, there's a great correlation right there. You invested a lot of cycling infrastructure up here, and there's a lot of people riding bikes, and you haven't done anything down here, and there's no one riding bikes. So, I mean. If, if you want to, you can really focus on the area down here and try to hone in on, on that region. And again, that's kind of looking at the data from the perspective of where are, um, where, you know, there is data in almost every single area. It's just not as heavily used in other areas. So if you want to see some lower use, used areas, throw away all the other data that's, that's drowning out that signal and focus in and hone in on that region. And you'll be amazed at how well um, patterns and things pop. Um, when you realize that there's actually there is data there, and it's actually still a lot of data in comparison to what you're, you know, to what a lot of groups are, feel success with. You know, for example, Cycle Philly had 220 users and on their cycling app, and they were ecstatic about it. You know, we had 15,000 in the same region, um, and you know, the, the difference in levels of data. Yeah. 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 One, yeah, one follow up. Oh, I got some over. Um, echo in your side room there. But um, what I was going to offer in was we look at the use of the Strava data as our kind of like our starting point, but it's not an end all. Um, the reality of it is, is that there are other apps that also capture very similar to data. But the beauty of the Strava data is that it's, you provide a product, Strava Metro, where we can then use that information to make more informed decisions. But you know, I look at this is just the starting point that over time that the, I expand, I, I would anticipate our user base to expand and uh, try to capture as many users as possible. Yeah, yeah. So, question in this room, Ola. So sort of like a little follow up, when, when uh, Metro Orlando uh, partnered with Strava in 2014 before I got acquired the data uh, for the statewide. So, we made the basis, and I don't know, if, uh, Brian, if you've seen this in, in, in other cities, in larger cities that you have worked with. So we made the assumption that in the within the core, basically, um, the roads that we saw have high bicyclist use usage. Um, we are we made the assumption that are also those cyclists that that don't have the options that are their own their only mode of transportation is bicycling would more than likely use that same road because either lower speeds, uh, you know, they have bike lanes or, or, or whatever other method. So have you seen that that's the case in Seattle or or have, have, do you know if any other cities have basically done the overlay of the Strava as well as, you know, a community outreach where, yeah, you know, basically the folks in the community are saying, yes, we are using these roads. Have you heard about it at all? So the question was, have we... Um have we found that the primary roads used as defined by the population um, centers and advocacy groups will correlate back to the same cycle routes, main routes that are used within the Strava in different cities? And the answer is yes. I mean, we have. Um, San Francisco is one of them. You know, we, everyone knows Market Street and Barcadero and the Wiggle, right? I mean, and when you look at our numbers, those are the exact same three um, top notches for us. But what we are also showing is these new trends getting off of these roads because they're actually becoming so utilized. Um, but we'll, anyway, it's a, it's a good point. Well, what we're finding is, you know, these cyclists you know, that are on Strava or anywhere else, they they want they want to be safe. Um, and in particular, in urban environments, downtown where there's lots of streets, lots of cars, lots of lights, lots of people, they want. And if it's a recreation rider, they're trying to get out of the city as safely as possible to do a 50 mile recreation ride to come back. If, if that same person is trying to get to work on some Monday, they're going to go much different. Where we do find a difference in cycling behavior, and this is where that rider type thing comes in, is Saturday morning at 6 a.m. with 20 of their friends. Right? They're going to take a much different road than they would have taken on 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 on, on Tuesday on Tuesday morning by themselves, because there are 20 of them. There's Saturday. There's nobody on the road, and they now own the road. 
and that's a different feeling to be in a group like that, like right. But that same person on Monday when they're going to work and they just say bye to their kids, they're just they're just a part of the pack again, right? And they're just trying to get to work safe and get home safe. Um, I've got another question here, Brian. It's probably the last one. Um, why is the female count for users so much lower than the male? And then that's the first part of the question. The next part is, is there any marketing effort underway to try and get more females to download the app? Yes and yes. Um, yes and yes. So <laughs> Sounds like a good question. <laughs> it's, uh, you, you know what, it, it is, it's so spot on and it's something that we at Strava have known for a really long time and I think it does come from our from our really early uh, marketing route to, um, campaigns and being incredibly aggressive, like top tier marketing. Um, because we do, we, we market like Patagonia does, right? Patagonia markets like everyone's going to climb Mount Everest. Nobody, <laughs> yeah. you know, most of us don't climb Everest. Um, but I own Patagonia gear, um, right? So we market for this kind of more like competitive cyclist. Um, in the States, that's a little more challenging because Competitive cycling is really not that awesome in the states sometimes, right? I mean, like, it's it's not one of these in, like really like yeah, it's like, it's not like a Super Bowl. Um, but in the, in the United Kingdom, it is. Like, they're like yeah, you know, they're really all about it. And so um, it, it has different impacts. And so we're really we are really working with um, with um, with trying to get more females on board, as well as I think the whole entire U.S. is trying to get more more females on board. I think the U.S. population on cyclists is closer to 30 percent. And I think we have closer to 15. So yeah, we're off the national average, um, but it's well on our radar. Um, we all right. The, you mentioned another one other interesting piece, and you'll notice that Strava has it. Strava has never spoken to its customer base about Metro really, um, and I think that's because Strava is trying to figure out how to do that, and we're working on figuring out how to do that, how to really talk about Metro. Um, talk about commuting, talk about um, this thing that 85% of all of our users do um, in the right context with the right marketing and everything like that. And that's what I think you'll start seeing that in the next six months where we start talking to our user base about commuting, about Metro, about um, this lifestyle that we all live. All right, Brian, I do have one question from our audience here in the group. Uh, Kendall Lindsay from our Transportation Statistics Office. Um, in, in communities where there is existing data, um, as far as ridership and pedestrian counts, um, what is the comparative percentage of Strava users to their data sets? Or, you know, how much, how much of the Strava user is actually a percentage of the total picture in communities that have existing data sets? Great question. Um, we'll have a, a big section at, in, in the third hour about this, but just to highlight some of them, and it's, it sounds like a cop out, but it does vary um, so much. Um, like Manchester, yeah. United Kingdom, Manchester, United Kingdom, we're at 14% of total saturation um, on the roads. Perth, Australia, we're at six. Um, Seattle, we're between um, 2.3 and 5.1. Market Street in San Francisco, we're about 3.1. Um, Baltimore City, we were much lower. Um, so it's just really, it, it really depends upon where it is. We do find though that regardless of, so regardless of the total percentage of users that are on Strava, what we find is they're R squared, which means the, 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 whenever that population ebbs or flows, the Strava population ebbs and flows almost in a, as almost an identical percentage as that larger population, right? So if you plot month to month to month across, the, across a year, you'll find that it is, we have an R squared of like 0 0.91, 0 0.83, things like that. Where so it's, we're really, really on a nice linear spec. Um, it's just a matter of how much does that make up. And if you have three counters and you know you have one percent at one and three percent at another and six percent at another, well now you have a little slightly more complicated pro equation to work out with modeling perspectives. Like how do you start to account for the one percent coming up from the south, the two percent coming from the northeast, and the other two percent coming from the uh, northwest? Right, and so just how do you, how do you deal with that on a modeling level? And there's a bunch of papers coming out um, in the next couple months, all about how different groups are taking advantage of models um, and model using the data to model um, total throughput on their networks based upon either one either one counter or 150. All right, excellent. So uh, what I like to do now. Um, it's just kind of close out that first hour. Thank you, 
um, Brian, for an excellent overview. Um, and I thought we got some good questions. I've got some more questions that I did not answer, but I'll do my best to get with Brian to, uh, to answer those, to help me answer them. What I'd like to recommend now is a little, maybe a five or ten minute break uh, before we start hour two. Hour two is going to focus on our Strava Metro product details. And uh, I know what we did here is uh, I downloaded the agenda from the website and just kind of shared it with the group here. So maybe if you can, if you don't mind printing it up and sharing it with them there, I'd appreciate it. But uh, we'll go on break. We'll start back up again in 10 minutes. And uh, thanks again for your participation today.